Today's scripture reading comes from Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 to 35. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image, this image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it stuck, struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. This probably isn't a text that you've thought of before in conjunction with Advent. I had thought about, you know, maybe we need a big Advent banner that says Advent in Babylon or something along those lines. But Advent is not the season where we just mark off the four Sundays prior to Christmas so that we can come and worship the baby Jesus in a manger. Advent is a season where we remember and celebrate the coming of the King, the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ, into this world. And yes, he came about 2,000 years ago when he was incarnate in the womb of the Virgin Mary and born of her and he lived his life here in this world. He grew up, he died on the cross, he was buried, he rose from the dead and he ascended to heaven and we come to worship him every time we come to gather together, not at some stage in his life, but according to the reality of who he is right now. And I hope that during this Advent season, as we look at some non-typical sort of text that we'll be able to tie those back to that incarnation as we traditionally think of it in Bethlehem. Uh, there are a few years back, I guess quite a bit more than a few now, there was a song that was ostensibly a Christmas song, but it never got to Bethlehem either. It started on the other side and it never made it to the birth of the Savior. I guess it was more of an incarnation song, really. And these lyrics were put by a songwriter into the mouth of Mary, the mother of Jesus. And if you know what song I'm talking about, if you like this song, if you love this song, that's okay. But I just want to call this to our attention. Mary was made to say, I am waiting in a silent prayer. I am frightened by the load I bear. In a world as cold as stone, must I walk this path alone? Be with me now. Be with me now. Again, I'll give the disclaimer, if you like the song, that's okay. It just puzzles me when I hear those lyrics and then I compare them to the actual song of Mary that's recorded in scripture in Luke chapter 1 where Mary, the mother of Jesus, didn't get all wrapped up in her feelings of loneliness and the possibility that she'd be walking this road by herself. Instead, she said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Mary probably just said those words. We think of it as the Magnificat, and it's been set to music on many occasions. And it's the song of Mary that we should think of when we consider what was it like for her to bear the incarnate Christ within her womb. And on top of all of that, there's that line, um, the line with which it starts, I have traveled many moonless nights. And I heard that, I thought that's, that's making so many assumptions. The actual distance from Nazareth to Bethlehem is about 70 miles. Um, it's not difficult to walk 10 miles a day, even in the early stages of pregnancy when you're young and healthy and strong. 
And so she made this journey, and of course, we probably ought to ask the question, why in the world would she have ever traveled at night? The land was safer during the day, and that was a time when they would go on. So it, it sets a mood, it paints a picture. I've traveled many moonless nights. And instead of thinking of the story the way that it's revealed to us in scripture, we think of the story the way we've seen it portrayed, the way that it's often portrayed in movies and in television and even in the way that we organize our services sometimes. But there were some people who traveled a really great distance at that time to worship the child Jesus. There were some people who traveled a very long and dangerous road from the east all the way to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem, those men who are referenced in Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Now, we're going to start here, and in about four weeks, we're going to come back to these guys. Um, so if we don't answer all the questions that might exist, we'll hopefully do that later on. But there's a couple of things about this passage. We have seen his star in the east, or we have seen his star from where we were in the east. But it was more than just some sort of an astrological phenomenon. They had enough revelation to know that the person they were looking for whose birth was heralded by this star was someone who had been born king of the Jews. So who were these wise men? And what was it about the star they saw which made them think, Jerusalem, king of the Jews, let's go. Where did they come from and how many of them were there? Well, the last question is the easiest to answer, and the answer is, we have absolutely no idea how many there were. The Bible doesn't say. An old song says, we three kings of Orient are, but only because they brought three gifts and only because there had been some misunderstanding about another passage of scripture that turned them into kings. Another church tradition held that there were 14 of these wise men who came and worshiped at the house where Jesus was found. But I guess 14 kings of Orient, we didn't rhyme with the second part of the couplet, so they just stuck to three. As to where they came from, John Calvin wrote magi. The word translated as wise men in Matthew chapter 2 is well known to be the name given by the Persians and the Chaldees to astrologers and philosophers, and hence it may readily be conjectured that those men came from Persia. Now, once again, we don't know for sure. They came from the east. Persia is to the east. But the logic of this language which Calvin applies does make a great deal of sense. And it may help us answer the more difficult question, namely, what was it about the star which made them think we need to go to Jerusalem and worship the one who was born king of the Jews. Because it's long been assumed that these wise men were Gentiles or even pagans. I've taught that myself and now I have some questions about that. But Matthew Henry, one of my favorite go-to commentators, said this we are sure of, that they were Gentiles and not belonging to the commonwealth of Israel. The Jews regarded not Christ, but these Gentiles inquired him out. And it may well be true that they were Gentiles. On the other hand, there's another place in scripture that uses that same word, magi. As Calvin pointed out, it was well known to be the name given by the Persians and Chaldees to astrologers and philosophers. And in the Greek Septuagint version of the book of Daniel chapter 2, we find magi lumped in together with the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans, all of whom were summoned to interpret that dream of Nebuchadnezzar that Ed read to us just a few minutes ago. And among that group of magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and Chaldeans, there were four young Hebrew men, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, the latter three we know more commonly as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But of the four of them, Daniel chapter 1 verse 20 says, in every matter of wisdom 
and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. And not only were they included in that bunch and influential among that group of wise men for decades, Daniel wrote a book. Daniel wrote a book recording God's work among the nations by which Israel was being held captive. And in that book, Daniel spoke very specifically of the coming of an anointed one, a king, the Messiah. And Daniel anchored that prophecy in history with such accuracy that it would have actually been more surprising if these wise men in Babylon who spent all their time reading books and studying texts and looking at the stars and watching for omens of these events didn't come from the east saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? Because Daniel made it very clear that a certain number of years after the going out of the decree to rebuild the temple and the wall, and a certain number of years after that, Messiah, the prince, would come. Now, Calvin acknowledged that there had to be more than just the star, although he came at it from a little bit different direction. He wrote, since astrology is undoubtedly confined within the limits of nature, its guidance alone could not have conducted the Magi to Christ, so they must have been aided by what Calvin then described as a secret revelation of the spirit but of course the prophecies of Daniel who was there and of Ezekiel who was there and perhaps all the prophetic writings of the old covenant scripture which would have been taken to those Jews who remained in the east even after they returned from exile that would also qualify as revelation given by the spirit of God And it may very well, I believe, have been the scripture itself that was used to highlight the prophetic significance of this star seen by the Magi. And I don't want to be too dogmatic about that. But since Holy Scripture has often been and is now the only way in which God communicates his will to his people, this seems to make the most sense. And we'll talk more about that on another occasion. But for now, we would do well to notice that the prophecies of Daniel and the various dreams and visions that he interpreted for these pagan monarchs really all had one focus. They focused on the kingdom of God. They focused on the coming of the one who would be born king of the Jews. And really, he would be born king of so much more than just that. We see it even in the dream described in the text that we read a little while ago. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, had been troubled by a dream that had left him sleepless when it was passed. And so he commanded that the magicians, the magi, that's that word, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell him not only the interpretation of the dream, he wanted them to tell him him the dream themselves. He had a dream, he knew what the dream had been, but he didn't trust these men to be honest in their interpretation of the dream, so he said, well, you know what, if you can tell me what I dreamed, then I'll believe you when you tell me why I dreamed it. And those who were summoned protested this, Daniel chapter 2, verses 10 through 11 The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demands, for no great and powerful king has ever asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Well, this turned out, not strictly speaking, but it turned out to be mostly true. Still, even though it was mostly true, because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them too. Because Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah were included 
among the wise men of Babylon. There's much more to this. You can read the rest of the story for yourself in Daniel chapter 2. But Daniel, knowing that only God could give the revelation that the king had asked for, he, he asked for a little bit of time and he gathered his friends together and they prayed and they sought the face of God and they asked for God to reveal this mystery to them. And the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. So he made haste and he went before the king to make known the dream and its interpretation. As I said, we've read it before. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image, a large statue. That's what Nebuchadnezzar saw. That's important. When you get to chapter 3 of Daniel, verse 1, he saw a large statue. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. That's pretty straightforward, really. We, we imagine dreaming of a huge statue, and it doesn't seem like it would be all that terrifying. But the interpretation begins in verses 37 and 38, where Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, You, O king, the king of kings, small k, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, you are the head of gold. And once you understand that much, the rest of this vision is pretty clear. After Nebuchadnezzar, after the Babylonian Empire, would come three more world empires in descending order, each inferior to the last in some ways, because the world, at least the world in the hands of sinful man, grows worse as it becomes older. At the same time, though, as the quality of the metals is diminishing, the hardness of those metals and the potential for violence kind of contained within them is increasing. Gold is precious. At that time, for sure, it was the most precious metal that could be found anywhere in the world. Nobody would ever make a sword from gold. Bronze is cheap. We're told in the kings, the books of the kings, that there was so much bronze in Jerusalem in Solomon's day, nobody even bothered to keep track of how much of it there was. But people did make swords from bronze. At the same time, an iron bar, just a blunt iron bar, would be strong enough to break a bronze sword. And so these empires are becoming less in terms of their beauty, perhaps, less in terms of some other things. But as we go down through history, we see them becoming increasingly strong, increasingly brutal, until we get to the place where Rome has overwhelmed all of the nations and expanded its territory from one end of the known world to the other end of the known world. But I think the part of the dream that must have terrified Nebuchadnezzar the most is found in verses 34 and 35. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and it broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, of course, in verse 47, the king answered and said to Daniel, truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. But if you want to know why it scared Nebuchadnezzar and how he really felt about it, even when he understood it, all you have to do is look across the page to chapter 3, verse 1. Remember in his dream, Nebuchadnezzar saw a great, a large statue. Well, in Daniel chapter 3, verse 1, King Nebuchadnezzar made a statue. He made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. That's roughly 90 feet tall. And its breadth, 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. He dreamed of an image that was gold, silver, bronze, iron, iron mixed with clay. Daniel came along and he said, you, O king, you're the head of gold. And Nebuchadnezzar says, thanks for the interpretation of the dream, but how about we try another approach? How about we make an image that is all 
of gold. And when all of the pawns in my kingdom say, oh, king, live forever, I'll just try to do that. Of course, God did mind. But that's another text for another day. But the question remains, not what are the empires, we know what those are, but what was that stone cut by no human hand that brought an end to the empires of this world? that brought an end to the dominion of those kingdoms, that brought an end, we're told, in another place to the blindness with which Satan was able to afflict the nations in the time before this vision was fulfilled. Well, that stone that became a great mountain, that filled the whole earth, that terrified Nebuchadnezzar, that robbed him of sleep, I think Revelation 11, verse 15, describes it best. What he saw in this vision was just another way of what John said about his vision. The kingdom of this world, the kingdom of Babylon, the kingdom of Medo-Persia, the kingdom of Greece, the kingdom of Rome, all of the nations that exist down to this very day, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The way Handel put it. Throw that one in. See, there's no sense here in which Jesus came at Advent and he did his little baby thing and then he grew up and he died on the cross and then he went away to heaven just to hang out there with the Father until such time as God said, okay, you, you can go back now. In some prophetic schemes that you can go back now is the result of everything's gotten as bad as it could possibly get. There's nothing else that's going to work, so you're going to have to go back in person. But that's not what Scripture teaches. Jesus is the stone who was cut without hands from the mountain that struck the kingdoms of this world, that just blew them into chaff that the wind drove away. And when we take that in context with the rest of what's happening in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, and in the days of those kings, the kings who represent the Roman Empire as a feed of iron mixed with clay, in the days of those kings, in the days of the Roman Empire, 2,000-ish years ago, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Where is Nebuchadnezzar's great statue now? We can only imagine what might have happened to it after they turned off the furnace and shut the thing down. Where the pillars that were set up as idols to the Roman Caesars who were thought to be gods themselves. It's all gone. Like chaff before the summer wind. But the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ shall endure forever and ever. God has established a kingdom in his son and that kingdom will never be broken. We'll be looking at that more as we go through Advent. It's a long road from that vision of Daniel to this question that the wise men asked, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? But this is the first answer that Daniel gives. In Daniel chapter 2, he who has been born king of the Jews, Jesus Christ is the stone cut out by no human hand. He is the king whose kingdom has overcome the world. And it shall never be destroyed, nor shall it be left to another people. He is the stone that the builders rejected, who has become the cornerstone, the head of the corner. He is the rock upon which his church has been built. And he said to Peter and the other disciples, because it is built on that rock, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. No kingdom has any place trying to legislate against the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. 
And what Nebuchadnezzar saw was a vision of the king, the king of kings and his glorious kingdom. So in our day, Roughly two and a half millennia later, the kingdom has come. It came with Jesus. He said, the kingdom of God is among you. The kingdom is coming. It comes around us every day in all the world as God works out his purpose in history. And the kingdom will come, we are confident, in its fullness one day. It will achieve the stated aim. And that kingdom will fill the whole earth. There will be no pluralism, principled or otherwise. But Christ will be king over all and God will be all in all. And we live as that kingdom is growing and building and that's why we pray your kingdom come. Which is to say, Lord, rule us. Have you ever really looked at what the catechism says? We pray, Lord, your kingdom come, and we often think about, well, make stuff happen out there. The author of the catechism says, when we pray your kingdom come, we're praying, Lord, rule us. Rule us by your word and spirit in such a way that more and more we submit to you because that's what it means to be ruled. Keep your church strong and add to it. Destroy the devil's work. Destroy all those things in our society, in our culture that militate against your will as expressed in your word. Destroy the devil's work. Destroy every force which revolts against you and every conspiracy against your word. We're talking about what it means to pray the Lord's Prayer and we're saying what it means to pray it is to say, destroy the devil's work. Destroy every force which revolts against you. Destroy every conspiracy against your word and do this until your kingdom is so complete and perfect that in it, you are all in all. And until that day comes, and it will, it will absolutely come, we remember that even now, our citizenship is in heaven. If you're a Christian, your citizenship is not in Canada, it's not in Holland, it's not in the United States or anywhere else. Your citizenship is in heaven. As Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 3, and from there we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. How do we know that he can do this? He will do it by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. The power that Christ will exert to transform your lowly body is the very same power that he is using even now to subject the universe to his wise and holy rule. So the wise men went looking to worship the one who was born king of the Jews. One commentator suggests that maybe they believed one day he would be their king too. But we have seen and we believe. We don't have to go looking for the one who was born king of the Jews. The baby in Bethlehem's manger, the son of God incarnate, grew up. He lived a sinless life, and then he died a sinner's death, and he was buried, and on the third day he rose again, and after he rose from the dead, he ascended to the right hand of God the Father Almighty, there to rule, to rule the nations with a rod of iron, dashing them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Even so, the kingdom of of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever.